So today we're going to do chapter 9 of Seleucius and the Gods in the World, and it's going to be concerning providence, fate, and fortune. So from hence all also we may perceive the providence of the gods. For how could order be inserted into the world if there be no one who distributes it into order? From whence, too, could all things be produced for the sake of something? As, for instance, the rational soul that there that there be might be sense, the rational that the earth might be adorned. From natural effects, likewise, we perceive the operations of providence, for it has constructed the eyes of the diaphanous nature for those purpose for the purposes of seeing. But the nostrils above the mouth, that we might distinguish disagreeable smells, and of the teeth, the middle the middle are fashioned sharp for the purpose of cutting. But those situated in the more interior part of the mouth are broad for the purposes of bruising the aliment into pieces. It's interesting that they understood even back then how the teeth worked, that some teeth are for chewing and some are for shredding. And thus we may perceive in all things that nothing is constructed without a reason and design. So, so basically saying that atheism is not possible because everything we do and see, it has a touch of the divine in it. But since so much providence is displayed in the last things, it is impossible that it should not subsist in such as are the first. Besides, divinations and the healing of bodies take place from the, bene the beneficent providence of the gods. And it's necessary to believe that a similar concern about the world is exerted by the gods without either expecting reward or enduring labor in the exertion. But that as bodies endure with power or be endued, but endued with power, produce essentially or by their very essence that which they produce as the sun illuminates and heats by, which, by that which he is alone. So the providence of the gods, by much of a greater reason, without the labor and difficulty to itself, confers good on the subjects of its providential exertions, so that by the means the objections of the Epicureans against providence are dissolved. For they say that which is divine is neither the cause of the molestation to itself nor to others. And such is the incorporeal providence of the gods about bodies and souls. But the, bene the beneficent exertion of the gods resulting from and subsisting in bodies is different from the former and is called fate because it's, a seri its series is more apparent in bodies and for the sake of which also the mathematical art was invented. That human affairs, therefore, and particularly a corporeal nature, are not only directed by the gods, but from divine bodies also. It's highly consonant to reason and truth, and hence reason dictates that health and sickness, prosperous and adverse fortune, proceed from these according to everyone's particular desert, desert, deserts. Blah. Yeah, I'm thinking of food, I guess. But to refer injustice and crimes committed through the lavaciousness and wantonness to fate leaves us indeed good. But the gods, evil and base, unless some one should endeavor to remove this consequence by replying that everything which the world contains, whatever has a natural substance, is good. But the nature from which is badly nourished, or which is of more imbecile condition, changes the good proceedings from fate into something worse. Just as the sun though it is good itself, becomes noxious to the blear, the blear-eyed and feverish. For on what account do, the, do they devour their parents? The Hebrews use circumcision, and the Persians preserve their nobility. But how can astrologers call Saturn and Mars noxious? Yet again, celebrate these planets as, ben, as beneficent by asserting that philosophy kingdoms, and military command are the right gifts. If they assign triangles and squares as the cause, it is the absurd that human virtue should everywhere remain the same, but that the God should be subject to mutation from diversity of places. But that nobility 
or ignobility of parents may be predicted from the stars. Shows that they do not produce all things, but only signify some. By their, for, by their different situations and aspects. For how can things which subsist prior to generation be produced from generation? As therefore providence and fate subsists about nations and cities, as likewise about every individual of humankind. So also fortune, about which it is now requisite to speak. Fortune, therefore, must be considered as a power of the gods, disposing things differing from each other and happening contrary to expectation, to benefit purposes. And on this account, it is proper that cities should celebrate this goddess in common. Since every city is composed from different particulars, but the goddess holds her domain in the sublunary concerns. Since everything fortuitous is ex uh, excluded from the regions above the moon. But if, let's see, but if the evil enjoys prosperous fortune and the worthy are oppressed with want, there is nothing wonderful in such a dispensation. For the former considers riches as all things, but they are despised by the latter. And besides this, prosperous events do not diminish the depravity of evil, but the virtue is alone sufficient to the good. So someone was asking me about fate, of what, it, how I see fate, and what Seleucia says again in this chapter is that the human affairs, therefore, are particularly a corporeal nature, and are not only directed by the gods, but from divine bodies also, and is highly consonant to reason and truth, and hence reason dictates that health and sickness, prosperous and bad fortune, proceed from these according to everyone's particular life. But to refer injustice and crimes committed through the lavaciousness and wanton to fate leaves us indeed good, but in but so forth. So basically, that everything is according to Seleucius, predetermined that fate was kind of a is real. So I don't know how I know some people say fate; they believe in fate, some don't. But if we look at um, leave that there. So if we look at um, some of the hymns. We know that God, certain gods in the hymns can see into the future and give us advice for they see and know what's going to come. For that to be said, then there has to be some kind of particular path. And it says that even if someone's fated to do evil and benefit from it, they are still hated by the rest of the world. So it is kind of a trade-off in a bad way that they don't get away with it without having some kind of blemish to them so we can talk about fate in another video but that is going over chapter nine so it's a pretty interesting chapter and he's going to break down more into these in the next few chapters of what is virtue and vice what is depravity so we'll talk about that more in the future but basically that to see the world and to see how our eyes even work, just something like how our eyes focus and the detail that's put into the eyes and the way everything is, is proof that there is divinity behind everything. So we'll talk about more of the other stuff in our next videos and I'll see you then. And I hope you guys enjoy the series and I'll see you next time on Sundays with Seleucius. Bye.